I'll tell you who All he right. is. Good evening. Unless folks I forget. that are here in the room together and those that are watching from far away. Uh, you might notice that Fritz is prepared. You can see what he's prepared to teach us about tonight. But I do want to pause and pray that God would help us to learn from our heritage and to be able to face the situations in which he's called us to live now. Will you bow with me? Do we ask your Holy, Holy Spirit to come and to teach us tonight to lift our hearts up to you? We're crying out to you to direct us and that uh, those that are placed here by your grace for such a time as this will trust you to step forward. And now, dear God, we rejoice that you're always on your throne. Amen. 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 Thank you. Sounds like I'm on, too. <laughs> like I'm hooked up. All right, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those that are here and those that are online, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the Bedford Boys. Um, it is, this is a true story. This is not fictional. It's not made up. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, everything in here is historically accurate, what you see. War, sacrifice, courage, love, friendship, love. I actually used to present this at my high school because I taught World War II class there twice a year for 15 years. And I would present this over six days. Alex Kershaw is an author, a pretty good author. He does a lot of World War II, I guess mainly, but I think he does some other things. Okay? He wrote this book, probably the best single book telling the story of the Bedford Boys. So uh, a lot of what you see here is from him. Thank you, Alex. Okay. All right, story of Company A, 116th Infantry Regiment, 29th Infantry Division. Kelly, we happen to know anybody else in the 29th Infantry Division? Not my husband. Okay. So uh, hometown here, okay? Um, this is the division patch. Okay, it's the blue-gray, and, and it gets called, a, I guess, a Chinese yin-yang symbol. It's a Maryland, Virginia, and a little bit of Pennsylvania uh, National Guard unit. There was a company during World War II that came out of Frederick, okay, uh, and a bunch of the other places around here, okay. Uh, so the blue and the gray, uh, one of the regiments actually was Stonewall Jackson's, so... Uh, do you understand the meaning of Memorial Day? If you don't, hopefully you'll have a little better understanding of it uh, after tonight, and maybe a little better understanding than Georgetown University does. Right. Uh, Fox News apparently put out together a, a fictional um, petition, took it on campus. Oh, we're trying to get a petition up here to stop Memorial Day, okay, to get, do away with it. And uh, like, they didn't really interview a whole lot of the students, at least in the segment that I saw, but one of them has asked uh, about Memorial Day and says, oh yeah, we should get rid of it. I, I, I learned about it in my feminism class, fe feminist studies, a okay, good place for it. And uh, America was imperialistic, so we should do away with Memorial Day. Well, the guy is clueless about what Memorial Day is about. Okay? Some good political cartoons. Uh, one here that uh, us Christians would, you know, have some understanding of, no greater love. Okay. And that, probably my personal favorite, Chicago Tribune, 2004. We've got a young lady here putting flowers on graves. This one more, war memorial is, uh, I think, uh, drawn or sketched after what is on the Omaha Beach grave site, or I'm sorry, the cemetery. You military heroes gave up all your tomorrow so I could have mine. Thank you. Right. Now, choose a Bedford boy. Assume the role, okay? You can choose anybody you want. You can duplicate roles. I don't know, Roy, if there's a, there's a Roy here. I don't know, maybe he's your guy, but doesn't have to be, okay? You can choose anybody else. Um, when I do this over six days with students, they learn a whole lot more about their person then you're going to have the opportunity to see tonight because we got you know limited time frame, but pick one of these people and follow them, and see if you uh, live or die through D-Day. Sorry, Hank. 
the uh, crowd at uh, Sunday sermon is going to be a little lighter because not all these people are going to make it. Okay. All right. Everybody got one? Anybody not got one? Okay. Anybody awake? We're here. Okay. I got no yeses on either one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. First day, I presented kind of a background of each individual. Okay, uh, they get their picture taken once they go into uh, the regular army, and these are a number of the peoples that you've seen there. Where the heck is Bedford? Well, it's actually done down the Interstate 81 corridor along the Blue Ridge, tight knit farming community settled in the uh, 1700s, and uh, you guys never expect to be in the very first wave on D-Day in June 6, 1944. Well, first off, you don't know that's coming yet. Uh, but you're going to be there, 33 Bedford boys. Okay, you've got Charlottesville here, Lynchburg here, Roanoke here, uh, Lexington, Virginia here. And Bedford is, I think, about uh, 25 miles east of Interstate 81. Okay? So right there okay, in Virginia. Small town USA, I think it had, uh, oh gosh, what was it, 3,000 people in, in 1940s. This is Main Street in October 2015. You still get that small town feel. Okay. Uh, key location there, particularly for young people, Lyle's Drug Store. There's a soda fountain in there. You know, so you go in there and you know, get ice cream sundaes, that kind of stuff. In 1939, East, or East Main Street looking west, okay? And some uh, kind of classic cars there, you know, from, oh gosh, that one looks like the early, early 30s or 20s. These are mostly 30s here, but uh, uh, Lyle's Drugstore, the building is still there, okay? It eventually became, becomes Green's Drugstore. And notice the Ivy Bridge Cafe. There's actually a link to something we're going to see here in the future from that. So this is Main Street. This is Bridge Street here. Uh, and if you go, whoa. let me try this again here. If you go across the street this way to the north, that's the other side of the street. And again, looks old town, you know, USA. High school you guys all go to, still there. Still being used as a middle school. Although there's a monument at the very front of it with uh, some of your names on it. Those graduates that died in World War II. Join the National Guard for a dollar a day. It's actually really big money in the Great Depression. All right? And uh, you get to play soldier with friends, brothers, cousins, uncles, maybe fathers. Uh, it's a big family thing. It's kind of a social thing. And again, big money in those times. Okay? Uh, you get to put your uniform on July 4th. You strut, strut down the street looking strack. Young ladies are on the side. Ooh, look at them. Okay. So good stuff. All right. uh, late 1930s, 38, 39, 40, uh, or into 40. Isolationists versus interventionists in the United States. Isolationists want to stay out of World War II. Hitler invades September 1st, 1939 into Poland, and it starts World War II off. Guys, we went and helped the British, the French fight the Germans in World War I. It cost 110,000 American dead okay, in World War I, okay, including, uh, I think, about 84 people from Frederick County. And guys, Frederick County back then wasn't that big. But I think they were very patriotic, and a lot of them you know, went and enlisted. So, you know, we got an ocean here, Pacific, an ocean here, Atlantic. Hey, we're thousands of miles away from this war. Let's stay the heck out of it. About 85% of American population is isolationist. 
There's some that kind of look and they see the writing on the wall. Somehow or other, we're going to get dragged into this. If you picked your person, hopefully I got a picture for you. We got Captain Taylor Fellows, his commanding officer, his cousin, Lieutenant Ray Nance. We got the uh, Powers brothers, Clyde and Jack. That's them two right there. I, don't, I can't remember which one is which at the moment, along with some of their siblings. There's actually three sets of brothers here in this National Guard unit. We got the Hoback brothers. Uh, Raymond, quiet, serious, Bible reader. Bedford, Motormouth, I think is what they called him. Okay? So I guess he just never stopped talking. Okay? So, got Raymond and Bedford. Stevens twins, Roy and, and Ray, they shared everything except girls. Good date sisters, apparently. Uh, must have been on good terms because 1938, they buy a farm together outside of, uh, you know, the main part of town. Okay. We got uh, Master Sergeant John Wilkes here and his wife Betty, both passionate about movies and bowling. Let's see, uh, how do they meet? Um, I think he's up at the school, at her school. John was at, actually out of the school by that particular time. And uh, it's a basketball game, and he, they're kind of standing that together, so they start up a conversation. And she says, after they're, I guess, part of the way through the conversation, she says, oh, by the way, my name's Betty. I knew that. Sounds like he had something planned here. You know, let's go stand next to this girl and see if we can start up a conversation. So they end up getting married. Uh, uh, have a honeymoon, I guess why he's in service. We got Frank Draper over here, baseball star, born on the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, probably not an expression we use a whole lot anymore, but uh, basically means, you know, you're from the poorer side of town, and maybe that side of town, maybe there's a few things going on there that some people wouldn't care for. Doesn't necessarily mean he's involved. Well, anyway, the train goes right through the town, okay? And there's our Draper home. Right. Got Charles Pfizer here, Earl Parker here. Earl falls madly in love with Viola Schrader and chases her, asks her to marry him. She agrees, and eventually they have a daughter. Right. So he'll be the only father of the Bedford boys. Alan Huddleston, this is taken over in Britain. Looks like he's got a uh, British hat there. And uh, Grant Yop here. So John Shank, his wife Ivy Lynn. Okay. Uh, this is actually their wedding outfit. Went and got married, and uh, I think she spent $25 for the whole outfit. Okay. Uh, and Dickie Overstreet here, I believe it's 1941, because this is supposedly a picture of him leaving town with the military, so that would be 41. All right, day two I'd present to my class, we talk about training. Well, September 1940, it's the Selective Service Act passed. What is that? It's basically a draft, right? Because this is a peacetime draft, our first ever. Roosevelt authorizes it. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he's the president at this time. He's on his, uh, uh, well, he's about ready to get elected for his third term, okay? Can't do that anymore. The reason you can't do that anymore is because him, he gets elected four times. So October 1940, you hear Company A is going to be mobilized into the regular army. That means you leave control of the governor and you become under control of the president. So they're going to get in the regular army. Newsweek makes a story out of it, not specifically of Bedford Boys or Company or 29th Division, because there are other divisions that do that. But uh, off into the regular army. Uh, Bedford newspaper, I think at that time it was called the Bedford Gazette, company inducted into the regular army. We're going to go to camp in about 10 days. This is uh, February 6, 1941. Guys, why is a dollar a day such a good deal? And by the way, when they go off, um, National Guard, usually it's like once a month. Like I think nowadays it's one weekend a month. I think back then it might have been a, a one, one or two nights a thing uh, a week. Um, but two weeks off in the summer, so when you got done from that two weeks, you got paid $15. Well, hey, we can go get three pounds of steak for 29 cents a pound, uh, hamburger for 15 cents a pound. We can get, uh, I'm assuming, dry beans, four pounds for 17 cents. Uh, let's see, where's our flour here? Uh, 24 pounds of flour for 65 cents. 
And uh, gosh, we can get two number two and a half cans of fruit cocktail for only 19 cents. So, by the way, uh, I think we got inflation co coming happening in America right now. A lot of inflation since then. Okay. February 3rd, 1941, you go to Bedford Army, you put up your right hand, you know, you swear to defend the Constitution in America. You go through your medical exams, you march behind the fireman's band, okay, farewell party at the high school, okay, in which you, chant, you get a chance to drink cans of old Virginia beer. And uh, lucky strike, cigarettes, okay. Uh, lucky strike greens, those were uh, considered one of the better cigarettes at that particular time. The camels were pretty good too. Guys, all at 10 cents a pack. I think a pack nowadays costs you like $7 or something. Okay. You, you know what it is, G? No, I said at least. Okay. Um, and a lot of those things are, are taxes that have been put on there to keep people from buying them, uh, you know, to discourage it because, you know, 1960s, they find out, hey, smoking, heart attacks, strokes, cancers. Uh, so it's a way to discourage people from smoking. John Shank meets future wife Ivy Lynn. We met her on that picture. Uh, the day the boys are inducted in the U.S. Army, he's handsome with blue eyes and a beautiful smile. Uh, pictures taken before, before you're leaving for Fort Meade. Uh, kind of old uniforms here, although they still were using these cartridges, belts in World War I and World War II. But most of the rest of those uniforms are going to disappear. If you get down to Bedford at the Visitor Center, they got this painting in there. I Will Hold You in My Dreams by William F Phillips. This is the train station. It's still there. It's a restaurant. And boy, they got the best breaded chicken cutlet with a raspberry sauce that I've ever had. When I went down a second time, I made sure I stopped by and got another one after I having the first one. Okay. Guys, trains are so important during World War II. You know, we have cars, we have trucks, but to get where you're going with all these soldiers, with, you know, tanks they've got to move and trucks and supplies, trains are it, okay? Um, again, not that the other doesn't exist. I'm sorry. Uh, you said World War II, but are we talking about World War I? Well, I, I had mentioned World War I. We're mainly talking about World War II. Because, yeah, yeah, I think I said that the guys had the belts in World War I will be the same one they have in World War II, okay? So, yeah, I, I did flip in World War I there as well. But this is mainly about World War II, okay? And the D-Day invasion. Sure. Got any other questions? Let me know, okay? Um, if you were on leave or if you got called in later, you know, looks like these guys are going off. You know, it's not like the whole unit's going, but... You know, hey, say goodbye to your fiance or your wife or whatever. Bye to mom and dad. But you go everywhere, most places by train. Military has priority. If you're a civilian, you might get bumped. Okay? Off to Fort Meade, shots in both arms. I guess you get, might get shots where the sun doesn't shine. Um, remember, you're in there at February and boredom. You keep training and training and training, but you're not in the war. Uh, how do you keep young men that are 18, 19, 20, 21 occupied? Okay, pretty tough thing to do because they want to get out and do things. December 7th, things are going to change. Pearl Harbor, Japanese bomb, Pearl Harbor. And uh, let's see. Did you take Roy? Roy? Okay. Uh, you're already in training, and you go off to the pub that night, or, or yeah, or to a, a bar. Okay, we're, we're not in Britain yet, but you and some of your buddies go off there, and uh, I, I think you say, after three beers, we had already beaten the Japs, and he, he used the word Japs. Okay, that's what we called them back then, guys. You know, sorry for if you feel about political correctness, you're not historically correct. That's what we call them, right? Okay? But, hey, 
that was a fairly common idea, you know. Uh, if you look at the propaganda, you know, they've got glasses and they can't see and they're, you know, nearsighted and, you know, kind of look like monsters, big buck teeth. Uh, hey, we're going to beat them in nothing flat. Well, surprise. 17th August, you head for Florida's Camp Blanding near Jacksonville, Florida. And then you stay down there for a little while, not, not too long, but you receive word to go overseas. There's two rail lines out of uh, Florida, Jacksonville. One goes north, one goes west. Any idea what, what the difference between them is? What does it mean? Where are you going? If you got the one west, you're headed where? Japan. California. And then off to fight the Japanese. If you're going north, you're probably going to be fighting the Germans and the Italians in I don't think we've invaded, uh, we're just about ready to invade North Africa and take that away from the Germans. And then we're going to go to Sicily in 43 and I think Italy in 43, but we don't get into France until 44. Your arrival at Fort Meade, okay, uh, that's Fort Meade with the National Security Agency nowadays, much, much fancier fort than it was back then. Uh, looks pretty muddy here. Uh, we're going to have to have those guys, you know, shine their boots here. Um, when I got in service, actually, we were still using these barracks, double level. They hold a platoon. They have, they have you in those uh, double level buildings like that, too? Yeah. Okay. Well, Betty Wilkes, she's actually here in the dark uh, dress. She, Elaine Coffey, Viola Parker the one that's married to uh, Earl Parker. Uh, get down to Florida for a last chance to meet you. Uh, they've got a soldier that comes by and uh, let's see, I think Betty asks him, can you take a picture of all of us? So we got, you know, six couples here and uh, I believe all those ladies are from Bedford and those are their sweethearts, okay? Most Bedford boys, prefer the sand to the jungle. The train does go north. You pick up a ride on the Queen Mary. Guys, the Queen Mary is like a not so fancy version of the love boat, but it's a love boat from an earlier time. It's the you know, ship that you take the cruises on. A lot of you end up getting seasick. Guys, it holds 11 to 12,000 people on it, and you don't all get your own berth, okay? And you can see the crowds that are on there. Well, no showers, no, lots of boredom. Uh, food's not that great. Um, although, uh, again, I think, uh, I think Roy actually did enjoy the trip over there, except for the food. But uh, they get, I think, about 400 miles out from Britain. And there's a British escort group that comes out with a cruiser, a light cruiser and uh, three or four destroyers. And they're supposed to escort them in because uh, they're concerned with submarines. Somebody, and you're actually traveling a zigzag course. You go this way and then this way and then this way, okay? Because you're trying to foul up possible torpedoes. Now, the Queen Mary is so fast. I think it sails at about 28 knots. Uh, and knots is like a nautical mile. It's actually a little bit bigger distance than a regular mile like we know, uh, not by a whole lot, but um, German submarines can't go that fast, so they just put it out there and let it outrun the submarines until, again, they got close there. Well, apparently somebody zigged when they should have zagged, and that Queen Mary goes right through that ship, the, Kira, the British ship Kirakoa. Uh, 338 dead. Uh, a lot of them have end up with hypothermia. And when you cut a ship in half, I think the back half went down really quickly. Front half stayed up a little bit longer, but still went down pretty quickly. So hypothermia, again, an issue. And uh, British blog, uh, Today in British History, it's got it, had any, a painting of it. Um, Queen Mary's about 10 times as big as that British cruiser. And that light cruiser is not a small ship. I mean, it's not super big like a battleship or a carrier, but uh, again, 338 dead. Um, you're told not to stop because if you stop and pick up survivors, and there are German subs, they sink your, th your the Queen Mary, 
you've lost 11 or 12,000, maybe like that. First new home is going to be Tidworth Barracks. Then you're going to move to Ivy Bridge after a couple months. You guys get Hershey bars, okay? Part of Hershey's war effort. Um, most of these English kids, they don't get access to chocolate. They're on severe rationing. So, you know, you guys are giving out a lot to these young British, you know, boys and girls, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, however old, okay? You're going to spend the next 20 months training. And understand, by this particular time, you've already been in training for over a year. A uh, picture of Ivy Bridge there in the wintertime. Okay. Very small town. I think it has 1,500 people. You double the size of the town because you're, you're camped right outside there. they got four companies of about you know, 180, 200 men there. Um, lots of bars there. Eight pubs. Okay. I think the closest one is the uh, Sportsman's Bar or, or Sportsman's Pub. Apparently quite good. Okay. Uh, some fine romance. There's, there's actually a lot of British women that come home as, as war brides. Um, most of the British young men, they're in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Royal Marines. They're not around. And by the way, they're not very well paid. Um, the Americans are making a whole lot more money than they are, so they got money to spend on the young ladies. Um, Somebody, a Brit was asked about the Americans and being over there and what do you think of them? Oh, they're, they're lovely people, okay, these Americans. The only problem with this, they're overpaid, oversexed, and over here, okay? <laughs> so, I guess he didn't have too much problems with them. So. Your home is a Nissan hut. What the heck is a Nissan hut? Well, there's a picture of one. It's basically sheet metal. Guys, you're uh, only miles away from Plymouth. That's Plymouth, England, not Plymouth, Massachusetts. But it's actually where the Plymouth crew from Massachusetts sailed from to get to America. Okay, So you're really close to the shore. It's on the uh, southwestern coast of England. Lots of water to pick up as you go across the Atlantic because the predominant winds are westerly. Um, some strong winds coming off the Atlantic. So if you get a driving storm like we had some of maybe today and some other days, okay, can you imagine the noise beating on that thing? Well, it, it drives some of you guys, not literally crazy, but very annoying, okay? We got John Shank here. In the right side, looks like they had a little bit of snow. He's out there clowning around. He and Ivy Lynn have chosen 10 o'clock at night, which would be f f 5 o'clock uh, Virginia time, Maryland time, okay? And they, guys, no cell phones, no Zoom, no computers, no email. Uh, most of the time, you can't even make a phone call. You'd have to go through uh, uh, an act of God. Okay, but more or less to get that. Um, you don't get to go home. Um, my aunt's husband, I, he died before I ever met him or, or met her. He went off to the Pacific in 1942, I think in February, or he went into training in the Navy, got his training done, he went off to the Pacific, didn't come back for over three years. Okay, never came home. Okay, only thing they got was those postage stamp letters. You ever get a chance to call, call home, Bob? No. Okay. And that was a whole lot later. Okay. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, Dickie Overstreet right here. He and one of A Company men chasing the British ladies. Okay. Uh, you go to the Assault Training Center. This is actually a, uh, a fake landing craft. It's on the land. And you learn how to defend a heavily defended beach. You go down cargo nets. And actually, it's a big cargo or a net made out of, you know, ropes like this thick. You know, they put the cargo around or the, the net around cargo and lift it up with the derrick and put it into the hold. Well, you put them on the side of the ship and you climb down them into this little landing craft that's bouncing around down there. Kind of a dangerous thing to do because if you jump into the thing at the wrong time, you're, this little, sh little boat 
kind of crashes into the side and you might get your leg broke or you might drown, right? Uh, they put you in here in a certain order. They got the riflemen on the front, and I think the mortar men are towards the rear. Okay? Uh, and you practice emptying this landing craft over and over and over and over till it becomes a habit. I mean, that's the way the military does anything. Okay? Uh, you do it enough times, it becomes instinct. So in case you're getting shot at and you can't think right, your training's going to take over. Guys, every time somebody comes up with a new idea, hey, let's try it out on the 29th Division, okay? And, and see what new techniques we've got, okay? Uh, you are um, probably about 10 miles in a straight line from Slapton Sands and probably about 15 miles from Slapton Sands by roads. It's uh, a beach where you do a lot of training. The 1st Division's going to go there. The 29th's going to go there. The 4th Division, some other divisions, 2nd Division. Right. Uh, so you go there and practice your assaulting. Well, 4th Division comes by one night on their rehearsal, April 27th. They don't have a whole lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, destroyers, military ships, you know, combat ships out there in the English Channel protecting them. And there's German torpedo boats that are lured over by the heavy radio traffic. And they come about 125 miles across the English Channel. And they might have been sailing up and down the channel. And they're going to start shooting torpedoes. Okay? They're very, probably very much like our PT boats that Kennedy was on, President Kennedy, except he was on in the Pacific. Three of these LSTs are hit. Uh, I think these LSTs carry like 500 or so men or, and a number of tanks. They're called landing ship tank is what the LST stands for. Well, one of them's crippled, another burst into flames. Uh, can't get through those flames, so some of those guys die. One goes down almost immediately. And uh, 749 4th Division soldiers are killed. Okay? But we don't tell you guys. Okay? We don't want your morale to go down. Okay? We don't tell the American public until I think that becomes knowledge after the war ends. Right? Pretty big disaster. Lose 740 men in an avoidable accident. If anybody picked Dickey Overstreet, he actually gets chosen to carry the flamethrower. That would be a high on my list of things that I wouldn't want to carry, invading in a beach. Not what you want, Jeff. <laughs> Okay. Um, again, this is the assault training center. They've got barbed wire, German barbed wire up there. Um, and you, you practice blowing holes through with something called a Bangalore torpedo. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Okay. Um, then, as time gets closer and closer to the time we're going to invade, you're moved to what they call the sausage camps. Okay. And it's not road roadkill sausage. Okay. Not that good stuff Roy brings. You know. Um, what they are is containment camps to keep you isolated and to keep you from going anywhere and to a bar and maybe saying something that you shouldn't. There are German spies in Britain. Um, and the British intelligence does a really good effort at finding almost every single one of them. Okay? They capture them and they give them a choice. You've been arrested as a spy. What do we do with spies? We shoot them or hang them. So, you have that choice or you become a double agent for us. And the British, I think, turn all of them. Uh, and they start feeding Hitler false information, which leads him to believe the invasion's not going to go in a place called Normandy, but in a place called Pas de Calais, which is only about 25 miles from uh, Britain to France. And actually, I think you can go through the tunnel there underneath the water, if you want to go underneath the ocean for 25 miles. Okay. Doesn't sound like my favorite thing to do. All right, why are they called sausages? Uh, they're located alongside roads, and when they sketch them out on a map, they're long and skinny like a hot dog or a sausage. No fancy reason why they're that, except that's what they look like when they mark them out on the maps. You're in uh, D1 along with two million other men 
in, in different ones. Uh, camp out in tents on the northeast corner. Camp doesn't always smell good because we've learned a lot since the Civil War about sanitation and health. There's more Americans that die in the Civil War from disease and poor sanitation than are died by combat action. Um, so they take the excretions from the outhouses, burn them. I think they probably put diesel fuel on them and burn them and ship them out. I think they were doing that in Vietnam also. Okay. Backed up by Bob there. And if you've ever seen the movie Platoon, I think there's kind of a, a classic scene there where Charlie Sheen has to pull it out and he, he gets to burn it. And not high on the list of duties you want. All right, your letters are often censored. This is an actual letter from John Shank to his wife. And they probably took an X-Acto knife and cut that particular thing right out. Okay. Um, well, poem kind of flies around, can't write a thing, the censor to blame, just say I'm well and sign my name, can't say where we're going, don't know where we'll land, couldn't inform you if met by a band. Okay. So, a uh, little frustration with that. MPs everywhere, military police. Okay. Maybe even Andy was there, you know. Okay, doing military police duty. Uh, again, they don't want the Germans to know anything, okay? Because they will mass troops, ammunition, tanks, you know, and it's going to make it a lot harder for you. So no passes, and if you're caught out where you're not supposed to be, you're in big trouble. You do final prep on your kit. You waterproof and gasproof your uniforms. There is a fear of gas attack, although... Um, the Germans never used it on British, French, Canadians, Americans. They are using it on Jews in concentration camps, as well as Russians, you know, that are in these uh, extermination camps, and probably some Poles as well. Uh, Catholic Poles, as opposed to Jewish Poles. Um, but they never used it on that. We did have a ship loaded with chemical weapons, which kind of followed us around as we got, went from place to place, in case we ever needed to do some retaliation. We never needed to do that. Although, unfortunately, when that ship is parked in Italy at a harbor, Germans come over on a bombing run, they hit that ship, some of those gas, uh, probably artillery shells go off, and I think 80 Americans are killed from our own gas. Okay. Back in Bedford, several wives share news from boys over coffee at Green's Drugstore. Again, a social hotspot. And, you know, they've been over there training for 20 months. Heck, they're probably part of the invasion. Betty Wilkes, other wives, roll bandages in the basement of Bedford Library, a very common thing for people to do with the Red Cross. You know, again, you're isolated, you can't go out anywhere, so you play baseball, tackle football. And apparently, some of you apparently get a di disease called amphibia, which is not a real disease, guys, but, and, you know, amphibious assault. Uh, let's see, frogs and salamanders are amphibians, you know, part of their time on land, part of the time on water. So what does that mean? Uh, we're going to be unhappy on the water before we would be unhappy on the shore. Right? So it doesn't sound like you're going to have a very good time there. Battalion CEO goes to a briefing. Company will land on Dog Green next to a company of rangers. If you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, that's what they're talking about. Okay? And if you haven't seen it, see it at least once. Okay? Well worth it, especially the first 30 minutes, and you've got to connect the last five minutes with the first 30. Mass, listen to all the good news we got for you guys landing on this beach. We're going to have 1,285 tons of drop bombs dropped on the beach you guys are going to, all right? So that's sure as heck gonna knock out some of those Germans, you know, so you won't have to face as much. More good news, 40 minutes before you land, our battleships, our destroyers, our cruisers are gonna start shelling what they see German positions on the shore. More good news, inexperienced 716th Division is manning that sector, according to our military intelligence. Now. That includes, it, Germans are kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, so they got some people that are over 40 and like under 18, you know, 17-year-olds and stuff like that. 
uh, never been in combat. That's what this division's made up. And they probably even have uh, gotten people from other countries to join this unit. Like they, uh, I think they gave a number of polls and, you know, other countries, hey, you come be part of our army and we'll pay you and, you know, and you can get out of a prison camp, okay? And some of them do that, although their heart is generally not in it. More good news, floating D DD tanks, okay? What's a DD tank? It stands for dual drive. They're going to swim ashore, and they'll be there before you get there to knock out machine gun nests and things like that, all right? Here's Charlie Sector, where the Rangers go in from Saving Private Ryan. Here's A Company, uh, 1st B Battalion, 116th Regiment, coming in on Dog Green right next to them. Guys, your uh, ultimate goal on D-Day is Verville Samir, which is Verville on the sea, is what that stand means in French, okay? And there's a draw here. What the heck is draw? It's really just a valley, okay? Um, there's bluffs here. They're fairly substantial. You can't drive a truck up them or a tank. So you need these draws to run your trucks and tanks up and out off the beach if you're going to get inland anywhere. Right? So rangers come in. And again, if you've seen Saving Private Run, they've got this sector of the beach. And we move over a yard. And you've got your sector where you guys get to go. And by the way, Saving Private Ryan, as realistic as it is, it's even worse than that. All right, West Point maps here. Uh, you got bluffs of 100 to 170 feet. They're not really cliffs, you know, like that. Uh, and most of them aren't quite that steep. Below it, you got a shelf. And again, I think you can see that in Saving Private Ryan, a shingle where the people hide out. And about 300 yards between low water and high water. They've got the obstacles here. You're coming in at low tide. Okay. Cross Dog Green, the low tide, four to 500 yards. The beach is filled with obstacles. So you can take the crucial draw, name D1. Beaches are mined. Gullies leading up to the bluffs are covered by strong points called Stützpunks. German for strong point. They got MG42s up there. MG42 can fire 1,000 rounds per minute. That's a lot, putting out a lot. Uh, that poor measly M60, what did you say, 600 rounds? 600 something. OK. Uh, nasty weapon, OK. Verville draw has formidable stitch punks, DD tanks, and bombing are going to be crucial to neutralize this. But remember, we're getting that. Uh, Captain Fellers, I don't know if anybody chose him to follow. Kaler Fellers. He tells the regimental commanding officer, Colonel Canham, I can take a BAR, get up on that cliff, and deny that beach to any infantry group. What is a BAR? Well, this is a regular rifle that most of you would be carrying. A BAR is a little bit bigger. It's kind of a light machine gun. It's got a 20-round box magazine. It's a very, very effective weapon developed during World War I. Um, but, eh, still not exactly like an M40, uh, or I'm sorry, that MG42 machine gun, okay? Um, but a good weapon nonetheless. And he tells uh, Ray Nance, we're all going to be killed. I don't know if anybody chose Alan Huddleston. I don't know if he's practicing hand-to-hand -hand combat or if he's jumping off of something, but he jumps the wrong way and he breaks his ankle. He's off in the hospital. You don't have to land on D-Day. Save. Huh? Save. Huh. Did you pick Alan? Okay. Well, he's saved for that day anyway. See what else happens to him. General Coda is the assistant division commander. All right? He's going in, I think, on the first wave. He wants to go in at night because of what he sees here. He doesn't think this is going to be a good thing. But, hey, his superiors... It's going to be a cakewalk. You know, you've got nothing to worry about. You study sand table replicas of the beach so you know your job, and you look at them over and over and over again, okay? What's a sand table? 
It's just exactly what it says. You got a table, they put some sand on it, probably put some kind of rim on it, uh, you know, little pieces of wood to indicate fortifications or houses, uh, maybe some kind of wire to show you where barbed wire emplacements are, that kind of stuff. So you know what your job is. And they teach everybody that from the company commander down to the lowest private. Okay, something happens to other people. Uh, you know what your job is, okay? And uh, actually, United States Marines, I understand, are excellent at doing that, so everybody knows their job. Right? Although there's no Marines coming on this beach. General Bradley visits. Hey, you guys are lucky. Front row seats to the greatest show on earth. The line taken from what? Greatest show on earth. Where'd it come from? Okay. And actually, that was quite a good circus, okay? But that was their line. This is the greatest show on earth, okay? So you get to see the greatest show on earth. June 2nd, you're ordered to break camp. You load onto trucks and join a huge, huge convoy traveling south. Um, most of the British roads at that time are one lane each way. They actually close the lane going north and make them both going south. And uh, some of you guys are sitting in the trucks. Gosh, these roads are one way. I hope that's not a portend of something happening in the future. Right? We're on a one-way trip here. Right? Uh, Grant Yop, he's on his, he's in the hospital. He goes AWOL. AWOL means absent without leave, okay? Guys, he doesn't go absent without leave, because usually if you're in your regular unit, you might go absent without leave, you know, because you can't take it or you want to go see your girlfriend or something like that. This guy goes absent from his sick bed to join his buddies on D-Day. And Taylor Fellows has a sinus infection. He leaves his sick bed to join Company A. He wants to lead his troops and doesn't leave them there hanging by himself, all right? You arrive at Weymouth, form up dockside, march toward the troop ship, the Empire Javelin. Color picture, uh, color photography's just coming in pretty good at the end of the war. Uh, the seafront of Weymouth hasn't changed that much. It still looks pretty much like this. Um, some of these buildings have gotten a facelift, but uh, I don't know if that's 29th Division or not. We, we don't have that information. So... The boats, life on the boats, two kinds of boats or ships. Navy doesn't like it when you call a big, one of their big ships a boat, okay? They get really irritated with that. A, a boat's, you know, something that you row, all right? Well, there's two kinds. One of them is a troop ship. These troop ships are probably carry 700 to 1,000 men. I don't know exactly. Okay. Uh, the other one is an LCA, Landing Craft Army, which is a British version of our Higgins boat, probably plywood with a metal door, uh, usually hold like 30 to 36 people. And your uh, escort in is this guy here, Sub-Lieutenant Jimmy Green. Um, he and some of his buddies have dubbed you guys the Suicide Wave. Okay. So he's going to take you off that troop ship and take you to the beach. Okay. Jimmy Green. Okay. Here is your uh, troop ship, Empire Javelin. Here's an LCA. You can see it's much, much smaller. And again, meant to hold only about 30 people. Settle on to burst aboard the Javelin, although it's, it's less than a full day's trip across the English Channel. Ike is the nickname for uh, General Eisenhower, future President Eisenhower. <laughs> Man, this guy is... Four packs a day, right? A um, lot of stress with his job. He's put in overall command of this. And you're supposed to invade on June 5th, although you don't know that, okay? But the weather comes in and it gets really, really bad. If you'd gone on the 5th, you probably would not have succeeded, okay? The invasion probably would have failed. So he decided to postpone it for 24 hours. The weatherman tells him, there's going to be a 36-hour window where conditions are going to get better. It's not going to be sunny with a five-mile-an-hour breeze and low wave action, but it's going to be better. 
what do you want to do? Okay, because I don't have to make the decision, says the weatherman. He didn't really say that, but uh, he decides to postpone it one day. Um, you got to wait another 24 hours because you were all head up, let's go for the fifth, you know? Now I got to wait for the sixth. Now, kind of good news the general in charge, a guy by the name of uh, Rommel, the German general, his wife's birthday is on the sixth. Oh, this bad weather. The Allies never attack in bad weather. I'm going to go home and take this box of brand new shoes home to my wife and celebrate her birthday. Okay? So he's back in Germany. Okay? Um, there's actually five beaches you go in. They're 50 miles across from end to end. We got Americans coming in on Utah Beach. This is that fourth division, the one that got their 749 guys killed. Utah Beach, you're going in here on Omaha with the 1st Division in the 29th. Then you got a British Beaches on Gold and Sword, and the Canadians, 3rd Canadian Division's coming in on Juneau in between them. All right. Sitting on the boats, wait, 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 hurry up and wait. Is it time yet? All right. Stand around and talk, play cards, you know, whatever. No atheists in the foxholes, a fairly common expression. Um, amazing how some people get to God when they uh, uh, are faced with dangerous situations. But a lot of you attend those religious services. Earl Parker pulls out a picture of his daughter, Danny. She's born after he leaves for England. He has never seen her. If I could just see her once, I wouldn't mind dying. Stephen Squins load on different LCAs. Ray sticks his hand out to Roy. Roy's having none of that. I'll shake your hand when we get to Vereville Samur. Okay. Roy, bow, I'm sorry, Ray bows his head, sticks out his hand again. I'm not going to make it. Roy still refuses to shake his hand. You know, he doesn't want to put negativism in his brother's head. Right? 4 a.m., you stand on, your, on deck at your boat stations ready to climb into the British LCAs. And uh, the officers get kind of lucky. They don't have to climb down those cargo nest, nets. They have some of those landing craft up there at the top of the ship. They're, you know, strung on, I think, what they call davits that they then lower into the ocean. So the officers get to climb into the ship and then they're lowered into the ocean and they don't have to go down that thing. Now, the problem is they get part of the way down and one of the cables gets stuck, okay? So you've got the top of the ship here. They're down this level. The sewage outlets for the bathrooms are here. Every time it flushes, okay, they're getting decorated. And, and guys, if you're an enlisted man and that's happening to an officer, you're, you're probably getting a lot of laughs out of that. <laughs> that's typical of... Uh, Enlisted men, I would say from when I was in. Bob might be able to back me up on that. It happens. <laughs> anyway, those offices get decorated, and we're not talking with medals here. So your landing crafts form up, and you head for the beach. Two-hour trip. They drop you off about 12 miles out. They got two columns, three boats each, okay? And you're on your way. Okay. And you got uh, rangers to the right of you, and you got, uh, I think, the Company B or some other company to your left on the beach. You're going to have bombing craters to use as cover from those bombs that they get dropped. And as you get closer and closer, mortar and artillery fire from the Germans starts to pop into the seas near you. Uh, but you note, American bombers, a little bit of cloudiness or fog, they didn't want to drop any bombs on you, friendly fire, so they hold onto their bombs for probably two extra seconds. Well, guys, I, if, if Dick Bennett was here, I probably could ask him. Uh, if you're going, and I, I imagine the speed for a bombing run, you're trying to do 180 miles an hour or something like that, you slow it down so you can drop them more accurately. Well, guys, if you're going 180 miles an hour, Two seconds, we're talking probably a couple hundred yards. 
Right? Kill some cows. Kill some civilians. Sorry. No shell holes for you guys to hide in. Tough luck. Suck it up and get over it, you know? Don't whine like we do in the military. It wasn't our favorite word, gripe, gripe, gripe. Huh? Huh? Anybody pick our baseball man, Frank Draper? Any tank round goes through the side, hits him in the arm, practically blows off his arm. Uh, he keeps trying to stand up, but he's losing so much blood, you know, they put him back on the ground. He'll get sent back off as soon as that ship, or sorry, as that boat drops its people. All right. He's got about an hour to live. He's going to die on the way back. Sub-Lieutenant Green tells Captain Fellers good luck. Fellers leave with his men exiting after him and wading in towards the beach. Strangely, the, Ger strangely, the Germans hold their MG fire. Part of the reason, I think, why Sub-Lieutenant Green says Captain Fellers, he was the first man off his, his boat, he thinks he's the first man on that beach of all of them. Okay? So the Germans are just seeing them coming in. They're probably deciding what the heck to do. Okay? And being the first sometimes means they're not as ready for you as they will be five minutes later. Okay? Germans hold their machine gun fire. Fellers had asked Green to give covering fire. My troops are National Guard units. They've never been under combat. Can you put some fire on the enemy over our heads to give them some confidence? Uh, Jimmy Green says he tried to, unable to do so, and I think probably the reason why is if you've got waves that are coming in like this and you're shooting, it's okay like that, but as the wave goes down like that and then you're hitting your men and then probably up like that and you're shooting over the heads, uh, so it never gets done. LCA 911 is going to sink on the way, leaving Bedford boys Roy Stevens, Harold Wilkes, Charles Pfizer, Clyde Powers struggling with hypothermia in the chilly water. Hey, Roy, can you swim? Yeah. Okay, good thing. Okay. All that stuff on, good luck. <laughs> well, all right, guys, when you get back, we'll see if you live or die. If you want a five minute break, we'll get started about 8.05.
Okay, we're ready to go. Sounds like people can hear me. Yep. All right, Dog Green Beach, what do you face? Okay, you, you got a little idea of some of the things that you face, but let's check it out now and see what else. Well, my hero, I've never been a dog fan, but uh, Snoopy's my man. He doesn't eat much, and he doesn't poop in my yard. Okay, <laughs> but he's kind of going through the obstacles here. Uh, Charles Schultz, the cartoonist, is actually a World War II veteran. And every once in a while on Peanuts, he had, uh, well, he had Snoopy, I guess, in World War I. You know, he was uh, you know, flying against the Red Baron and stuff like that. In World War II, he invades on D-Day on, on one of that. And he, he also made a tribute to a guy by the name of Bull, Bill Malden, who was a famous American cartoonist from World War II. Heart of the city here, they've got uh, 66 years ago, so this is... Uh, 11 years ago, this cartoon was from. We got kind of invading on the thing. And we got a young lady here. What's that book about? And he's reading a book on D-Day, and it says Courage. <clears throat> Eisenhower, he gets on the, uh, I guess they got it so he can speak on these ships over the uh, loudspeaker. And he makes a speech, and he also has it sent out in uh, written form. 
Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon that great crusade towards which we've striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on the other fronts, bring about the destruction of the German war machine, elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Right. Again, Eisenhower, overall commander. Battleship Arkansas opens up, 8.0545 hours, and they're going to shoot for, I think, about 45 minutes. Charles Neighbor, a, a private from the 29th Division. I don't, I don't think he's actually a member of A Company. As our boat, boat touched sand and the ramp went down, I became a visitor to hell. H hour for the company, 6.36 a.m. Pretty low, about the lowest part of the tide you can get to. Bad news, guys. Remember those tanks? Those dual drive tanks, the ones that float in the water. Um, the landing craft tank LCT that are carrying them are making slow progress through the seas. So you're going by them, which means they're not going to be on the beach when you get there to help take out the machine guns and uh, other German positions. Sorry. Guys, how do you get a 30-plus tank? 30 plus ton tank to float? Well, they're called dual drives. They actually have a regular tank transmission, but on the back they've also got propellers, and you put that when you're going through the water. Um, if you go to Bovington Tank Museum, it's probably the best tank museum in the world, okay, in Britain. Um, they've got this thing up there, and you've got a Sherman tank there, and you put a metal frame on it, and you attach canvas to the outside. And you lift it up like that, and it kind of makes it like a, like a, sh like a ship in, in that sense. It's got buoyancy, so you can go through the water, as long as it's not too rough. And then you get on shore, and you can uh, drop the thing, and you can have your tank there. All right. All right. Um, on the left side of the beach, where the first division's coming in, they drop these tanks off. I think 2,000 yards out, and I think in two companies, I think there's two of them that make it in. The seas are so rough, it ends up swamping these, and actually, people still go out and dive and check out those tanks. All right? um, the guy on the west side of the beach, which is where you guys are going, he sees how rough the seas are, and he decides to take his landing craft tank pretty much all the way to the beach, and you get those tanks get down there, and I think uh, whereas on the left side of the beach they lose 48 tanks that day, and I think they have two left, you got 38 on the right side of the beach that are still there at the end of the day. So, um, George Bernard is a Frenchman. He does some masterful work showing what these fortifications were like, what you have to face. Guys, this is where you're going in, okay? Uh, Company A is going in from about here to here. The Rangers are coming in from about here on over probably to about there. What do you have to face? Well, you got some barbed wire there, you got some barbed wire there, you got some mines there, mines there, okay, any tank ditch. Uh, this is a casement. What is a casement? It's a big concrete emplacement to put an 88 millimeter gun. 88 millimeter guns, probably about yay big. Guys, that 88 millimeter gun, my father had to face them. Superb weapon, anti personnel, superb anti tank killer, and it was actually very good for shooting down planes as well. Probably one of the better artillery pieces of the war. Okay. Behind it, there's another co concrete embrasure with a 50 millimeter gun. And guys, these are right on the beach level, okay? And here's your draw. These brown lines here mean you've got the bluff, so you're going up in elevation. And they've got a Stutzpunk, strong point, WN-71 on top, and WN-72 up here, which continues on over here for a ways. These things are machine guns, okay? Got one, two, three, four, five, six machine guns in this sector here. Okay, you got uh, trenches. You got uh, a machine gun up there. I got a mortar here and a mortar here. 
Okay, another machine gun here in the side, a grand abri, it's like, like a shelter, observation post, okay, and some of the same stuff on the other side, okay? So, that's all you gotta face, guys. Why is that walking to hell? Well, actually, uh, uh, gosh, Clint Eastwood isn't around yet doing uh, Dirty Harry. What did he say? You know, cop, cop show? What, what is it, punk? Are you feeling lucky? Are you feeling lucky here, guys? Huh? Guys, 2018, there are still remnants of German trenches that are there. Actually, there's still remnants in some places in Europe of World War I trenches. Guys, this is the uh, German 88 millimeter gun embrasure. We've actually built a monument to you guys right on top of it, okay? This is what it looks like in World War II. Hey, there's your 88 millimeter gun, personnel killer, tank killer, okay? Um, if you got the water like this, you don't face it out this way because the American ships, British ships, would see that and they would just shoot right in the front of it and destroy that pretty quickly. So what you do is you got the beach like this, you have it face this way. All right, so it shoots down the beach. You can hardly miss a target. But the other thing is, that's like a three or four foot wall there, guys. And you build out on the front, so again, if the ships are out here, they can't hit the front of that. So they can't knock that gun out. So that gun's gonna stay there. Got a roadblock right there. I guess some mines right over here, out of the picture. What's it look like from in there? Actually, this is high tide, guys, but uh, somebody took a picture from the inside of there, and you can see the road that goes up there. But uh, again, this is high tide. You got a nice view of the beach there. Nice view of you guys. You feeling lucky yet? Behind it is this 50 millimeter gun embrasure. It doesn't have quite the same protection over here, and you can see it uh, looks like it took a little bit of a beating but they had another gun in there to back that one other one up. And notice there's a, looks like a hole in the cliff right there. The view from this thing is there. That's low tide. Right. Got a nice view of all you guys coming in. Wave as you go by. Right. Um, Again, as you uh, head up towards this place, there's that hole in the cliff. You've got actually pretty much a cliff here, a bluff up here, a smaller bluff here. Again, a little bit easier to climb up. There is a valley, a slight valley that goes up here. They don't have that asphalt, you know, bike path, walk path uh, during the time of World War II, but that valley is there. And guys, none of these buildings are there, with the exception of the casino, which is right there. Right? Inside of that gun emplacement I just showed you, that's your view of the beach. And that pier wasn't there either. Right? Again, they got a very good view of you. If you climb above that gun emplacement and get on the very, very top, where there's more German fortifications and mortars, okay? mortars are pretty deadly, and guys, the tide's already starting to come in here. It's probably in at least 100 yards, if not 150. Uh, great view of you guys. They got barbed wire still strung up, and this is 2018. Um, I think they do part of that for just a remembrance that the Germans had fortification there. This is actually real German barbed wire from uh, Luxembourg, okay? I'm assuming they probably use the stuff there. A hot, whole lot more barbs to it than there is on this. It's, it's not like the barbed wire we string out here for you know cows and stuff. We don't need anything quite that intense, but uh, pretty raggedy stuff. They also have something called Tobrooks. What are Tobrooks? They're concrete foxholes. Great things to have, okay? Because the sides don't collapse in if some artillery hits too close. And you can kind of go underneath and get under cover, 
uh, in case the shelling gets too intense. This one, they'd probably, whoa, try that again here. They probably put a mortar in here. Here they might have a single guy, like a sniper or something, or, or maybe a machine gunner. Um, good fortifications, you know, for your men. The uh, WN-71, the strong point you're attacking, or trying to attack, this is up there. It's a uh, mortar hole. Okay. And uh, um, I, I don't know what the actual letter's for. I think it's some German thing. It's a designation of forts or, or, or strong points. If you start at the far left of the beach, they had, I think, WN61 and then 62 a little further and then 63. Okay. Um, I, I think the initials stand for something, but I, I don't remember what it is, okay, so I can't tell you. Good question now, all right? Um, another fortification, and again, massive, massive stuff, guys, and most of the stuff is still there because they can't afford to tear it out, and it costs a lot of money, and actually, this is part of a park. Uh, at one of the entrances, they put like two feet worth of concrete there. In case there's a shell that came down here, you would, might get shrapnel getting in there and killing your people, or a concussion wave that would go in there and kill your people. So you put this there, it makes it very, very hard to knock that out with a shell that hits close. Germans got obstacles in the water, meant to damage boats generally, not really to kill or hurt you, at least not directly. They're going after the boats. Um, and uh, if you watch Saving Private Ryan, as good as Saving Private Ryan is, they got the obstacles backwards, right? This is the shore, this is the water. They got them, you know, pointing in. In the movie, they're pointed out. So you got that obstacle. You also got something, they just put a pole in the ground, they put a teller mine on top. If you're coming in the high tide, your boat might hit that mine and put a hole in your uh, landing craft, okay? And then you might lose, you know, five or 10 dead, more wounded, and the boat might sink too. And then you can't reuse that boat to bring in more people and ammunition and food. Okay, they've also got mines, okay? That'll kill and maim a lot of people. I had a reenactor from the 8th Division. He is an engineer, a combat engineer. He reenacts, and he's got a bouncing Betty here, all right? What the heck's a bouncing Betty? You come along and trip the wire, it's underground, okay? And it pops up about this high, okay? And shoots out generally, like, probably a little bit bigger than BBs, okay? Rounds like that, maybe like we'd put in the Claymore, okay? And uh, it, it kind of goes off at a level that guys really don't appreciate. Um, but all you have to do is you're getting shot at with machine guns and rifles and mortars and stuff like this. You just have to see the tripwire and avoid it. You guys see that tripwire right there? Okay. If you look really hard, it's on his first knuckle, like right here. Okay. All you got to do is spot that. You can step right over it. That's all. That's all. All right, what's a Bangalore torpedo? Our guys are carrying it in. If you've seen Saving Private Ryan, they actually use these. They're eight foot things, they've got explosives in them. And what you can do is you can put them under barbed wire. You put a blasting cap in an end, okay? That blasting cap blows that thing off, and hopefully it blows through the barbed wire. And there's actually a nice section in Saving Private Ryan where they string two of them together. I guess they got it 16 feet long, hat set it off and it blows the barbed wire so they can run through it and not get stuck on the barbed wire while the machine guns are shooting at them. All right? I would imagine getting 24 feet of that and working it would be pretty hard, but 16 feet might be okay. So that's Bangalore torpedo. Now, the German mortar positions. Guys, they've been there for years, since 1940. Right? They think they might be invaded by the British or some, something during the war, and they set up these mortar positions, and they actually paint oil paintings in the mortar position. They've got distances, 200 meters, and the way they use compass, they don't use degrees. Uh, I forgot exactly what they, they do. I think their compass is actually 
add up the other way, whereas ours goes clockwise, theirs goes counterclockwise. But if they see somebody standing on a road junction down there, they look down there and say, oh, that's 200 meters away. They've got their, their gun, their mortars preset, and they can hit you pretty much with the first round, all right? Because they've got, a, got their fire pre-registered. They probably, you know, fired in like a smoke round just to check and see, are we hitting on the right level, right? So then when things get hot and heavy, they don't have to put in a round, oh, well, that's 50 yards off, let's move it this way. It's already done, all right? German view of an invasion beach. We got barbed wire, barbed wire. I hate to have to get through that stuff. And the obstacles again at low tide. This is actually from the beach, pretty low tide. Um, and they, the Germans have some trenches with machine guns and snipers in here. They got a nice view of you. If you get on top of that WN-71, okay, uh, and again, you're coming in on this part of the beach. They can see right down. And this is very, very close to high tide. Okay? It's probably come in 250 yards, the water, which means if you come in on the high tide, you don't have as much to run, but then your boats are more at danger. Right? Actually, a 1954 picture uh, of the beach and it, I think it's still pretty representative. Not many houses or anything along there, and you can, again, see how open it is for the Germans to shoot at you. All right, you're on your ship, on your boat, your LCA, and you start you're looking out, and you see the bluffs there. Here's the Vero, Vero Samir draw, church steeple up there, and this is what your target is. You want to get up there. So that's all you're facing right there, guys. And that's your point you're headed for. Right. Oh, maybe it looks like some of you guys right there. Your boat grounds out on the bottom. The ramps get to the LCAs go down along the bluffs. Oh, sorry, guys, bad news. You know that stuff we were telling you about the inexperienced 716th Division? We were wrong. It's actually the 352nd Division, which has been around a while, okay? So they're very experienced. You'll have to face them instead. Germans have MG-42s trained on your sector. Two dozen snipers await in the trenches. Your, those mortars with their pre-registered fires open up on you. There's your Hitler's buzzsaw. The German MG-42 fires over 1,000 rounds a minute. Um, my understanding is the Americans look at this thing. It is very, very well engineered. And between the MG-34, the German earlier machine gun, and the MG-42, the Americans steal a whole lot of those ideas from it not every single one, and use them as engineering to make our MG-60, which Bob was a machine gunner of, okay? That weapon is that good. We stole ideas from it. So there you are hitting the beach, okay? Get off there and head for the, you know, draw, the, the bluffs. So you get dropped off there. That's when I took this picture. I'm actually standing, the water's right behind me. I didn't want to get my shoes wet. All right. So I walked, would have come in off the boat a little bit to the point where the land is, this, it's all sand there. So I've gone a little bit. All you got to do is run there, which is about a quarter mile up there with the German shooting at you. Okay? And heck, you got your... Uh, by the way, this pack is uh, probably only about half of what they would have had. Actually, Jeff, you help me out here. Can't find my arm. Hopefully, my wire won't go out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Put your ammunition belt on. Okay. Got your canteen. And by the way, guys, these weapons here. It's a hollowed out grenade, the rifle's unloaded, okay? But you got your canteen, your compass, your uh, medical pouch. Uh, your pack would have been bigger. You're carrying about 60 more pounds. Your uh, gas mask bag, you're carrying your gas mask in, okay? Officer, or maybe a binoculars. 
They actually used a lot of these leggings that went there. Uh, Bob was talking about blousing, you know, our pants and stuff. Well, this is a big thing they used in World War II to keep, you know, bugs from going up there. And your helmet, okay. Um, that feels like it weighs about five pounds. They are, in some ways, nicer than modern-day helmets, although not as protective, because you've got your water pot, your cooking pot, your, your toilet in some cases, uh, your pillow, okay, your, your rain hat, uh, some things that the uh, modern-day helmets, although they're much better, protection, your M1 rifle, right, which again is unloaded. Um, you're welcome to come up and see this stuff if you haven't done so already. Um, How much weight are you carrying with your rifle and all that stuff? All you got to do is carry the 60 pounds. And I think actually with the 60 pounds they were carrying didn't include the rifle. Uh, the stuff I've got here, helmet, binoculars, gas mask, this pack, um, and rifle. I weighed myself on a scale today, and I went up uh, 35 pounds, okay, for just this. And this pack is not, I don't have the full pack that they had. And I don't have ammunition. I didn't want to bring any ammunition, okay. The ammunition's going to weigh quite a bit, too, so. A dolly? Yeah. Okay. Well, that'd be handy. I hate to say it, but uh, Germans are pretty smart people. Germans are pretty smart people? Uh, why are you saying that? With all the stuff they've done on the beach there in preparation. You know, my dad fought them for six months on the front lines. He said it was the best army in the world. Although, by the end of the war, they're deteriorating because they just don't have the experience manpower anymore. But uh, I would put, I'd be wearing one of these nice wool shirts, although this is not the right division patch, okay? Uh, but they're, they're wool. And since the AC's out on this end of the building, I decided not to put this on tonight, okay? So. You get off the boat, that's all you got to run. Now, guys, notice there's not much here to hide behind. There would have been some obstacles out there. Um, but all you got to do is run like a quarter mile in there. This is actually uh, where the uh, casino was. So that building was there during the war. But uh, all the rest of this stuff, not there. Right? Okay, you've trucked in with your 60 pounds and your rifle over halfway, but you're still not there yet, okay? I think I'd be getting pretty tired. And again, casino here. You can see the draw much better. Again, the valley between WN71 on top of the bluff and WN72 on top of this bluff. Larry Selman's a World War II painter, Stonewall Brigade at Omaha Beach on D-Day. Um, he's got the yin-yang blue and gray patch there. He, kind of realistic here because he's got the machine gun, you know, ripples from where the bullets are going off. This is a Browning automatic rifle, a BAR. Notice on their arms, they've got a sleeve. That's, that's supposed to change color if you run into gas. Uh, so once they got on the beach, that would be quickly dropped, probably along with the gas mask. I mean, these gas masks weren't carried very much at all during the war. Uh, and you got the obstacles that some people are hiding behind, so. Um, modern day picture. Anyway, guys, you're now in an area of crossfire. None of this stuff is here. Notice this kind of angle here, but right to the left of the draw, that's all you gotta do is to climb that, okay? Sure. Yeah, what is it, 60 degree angle? Um, 
Unfortunately, I had my flash on, didn't realize it. This is a picture from, uh, taken from September 1942. You can actually see that same place there. But again, you can see there's no houses there. And uh, you know the cliff is basically the same, but it uh, gives you more of an idea of what it's like in 44. This was probably taken right from, from the, where that uh, 88 gun was, because you can still see the gun sitting there. Um, WN-71. They did have a seawall there, apparently, during 1944, so you could kind of get down behind us, but if you're high enough on the bluff, you can probably still see them anyway. Here's your tank, I'm sorry, your 88 millimeter gun embrasure that shoots this way. And if you get down at the very bottom, like right here, that's all you gotta climb again. Nothing to it, right? Looking off to the right side of the beach where the rangers go on, this is where they, they go up. They do have some very strong cliffs up there. There's mortars up here and for other fortifications down here that they would assault. Robert Kappa, okay, is a photographer, combat photographer, okay, a very good one. He asked to go in on the first, first wave, and he does, all right? And he's going to take this picture on the next three you're going to see. He takes, I think, 11 rolls of film, sends them back to England. Whoever's developing them screws them up, except for one roll. So as a historian, you know, we've lost 10 new rolls of film of a major historic event. But I think you can get a feel for what it was like there. These guys are engineers. They're supposed to blow the obstacles as as the high tide comes in, you want these obstacles gone again so we don't, our ships don't get hit, and they're trying to mark lanes so that people can get in there safely. Men around me lay motionless, only the dead on the waterline rolled with the waves. Robert Kappa, U.S. War Correspondent. This is probably the, maybe the first picture he took. The guys have just left the, the landing craft, and they're headed into the beach. Um, kind of a double exposure here. Maybe he's getting shot at or something, you know? Uh, by the way, this guy does survive the war, and they are able to identify him. And again, these obstacles. If you see Saving Private Ryan, I can think, you can see from this movie why they filmed Saving Private Ryan in certain ways. Right. Not a whole lot of advance here. These guys are looking kind of petrified and frozen. They didn't really want to get off the beach. As you get to the shingle, you know, you run to the high tide line, and you can see in Saving Private Ryan, they got a little place to hide behind. So this is what it looks like in modern day times, okay? This is actually from the first division sector. This would be more like what you'd have where you guys are. And again, here's your WN-71 and WN-72. First Lieutenant Green sees fellers and his men lying down on a slight slope. Fellers rises. Follow me, guys, towards the D1 draw. Germans open up, kills Fellers. Sorry if you picked Fellers, you're gone now. 29 men out of, you know, 30 some odd from his LCA. Eight Bedford boys among them. Communications uh, landing craft comes in 19 minutes later. They figured they didn't need it on the first wave. Lieutenant Nance. Um, he's there, boat ramp gets stuck. He's, one of the he's the first one off and he heads straight off the boat. Then he looks back, nobody's following me. Where'd everybody go? Well, apparently the Germans tagged that boat and were you know, killing most of the people on it. He sees Bedford Hoback and two other Bedford boys lying on the beach, their bodies. He gets wounded and a machine gun starts playing games with him. And he doesn't want to lay down like this because he provides too much target, so he lies heads to the machine gun. Figures, if I get hit in the head, it's over like that. Um, but he's trying to hide also in a tidal pool like this. Okay, the, when, the, when the water goes out or is at low tide, you can kind of get in there and hide. He gets part of his heel torn away. Just as I was about to give up hope, I looked in the sky, there's kind of a rosy appearance there. A warm feeling came over me and I knew I was going to live. I would be patched up what I felt was a heaven-sent, immaculately dressed Navy corpsman. Okay? And uh, 
I don't know how he could be immaculately dressed on that beach. If you actually get to the D1 draw and start to head up it, okay, there's mines there, there's barbed wire, and if you look off to the left, there's a hole in the wall with a machine gun sticking out. So they're, you know, you kind of looking this way, they start shooting at you from the side. And there's another one on the other side. You can't see it here, but this is actually a double door. Right behind where this ivy's growing up here in, this would have been 2018 or 2013, there's another one of these over there. So you, you had two machine guns in there, or two snipers. Post D-Day, did you make it? Let's find out. June 6, President Roosevelt proclaims a D-Day prayer. Um, actually, I was going to bring a copy of it, but I left it at home. Didn't put that in my container, I guess. Um, anyway, it becomes a, a pretty famous uh, prayer that he makes there. Back in Bedford, word comes of the invasion. You know, bells are ringing in Bedford town. Uh, lots of people going to church. Dow Jones Adventure, average stock market goes way up. Wise parents, siblings listening to the radio trying to find out what can we find out about what's going on. Not a whole lot. Uh, Mrs. Parker, a relative of uh, Earl somewhere, okay, uh, she does a history report, you know, kind of reporting what was going on in the town at that time, and she cites for the uh, June 6, churches have been open all day with sad-faced worshipers going in and out constantly, tears only occasionally, right? Again, they're five hours behind you, so by the time you get up, most of the stuff is done. Unlike Saving Private Ryan, guys, 11 days before the first missing in action telegram gets there. And that's due to the confusion okay, that goes on. Uh, you don't know who's there and who's not there, who's missing. Are they going to show up? Were they captured? Were they killed? Were they in some hospital? Did they lose their dog tags? We can't tell who it is. We don't know. So it's 11 days before you get the first missing in action telegram. This is Elizabeth Teeth. She works in Green's Drugstore. She's, uh, her job is to come in, I guess at night, she turns off the telegraph machine, teletype machine. And when she comes in the morning, first thing she does, turn it on, okay? 21 years old. Spits out. Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret. Well, Elizabeth knows this is bad news. She waits for the message to end, but it keeps on going and going and going and going. Right? It doesn't stop. Within a few minutes, as Tease watched in a trance-like state, clear that something terrible had happened to Company A, I just sat and watched them and wondered, how many more is it going to be? Guys, this is not a telegram, but it's a letter to Mrs. Alice Powers, letting her know that uh, her son, Jack Powers, reported MIA is now officially been designated killed in action. Mrs. Shank. Uh, a, a student of hers, she's a teacher. A student of hers by the name of Booker Goggins writes her a letter. Uh, I think he's a first grader, and you can tell by the writing. I am sorry to hear about your husband. I wish I could come to see you. Uh, come see me. I hope I, you will be my teacher next fall. Uh, with love, Booker. Looks like uh, Booker's already competing with John. Uh, and uh, you can see, again, the cliffs back there. This is pretty low tide. This is D-Day plus one, June 7th, and we haven't taken care of all the casualties yet. Graves Registration Unit, busy, busy, busy. We actually, uh, probably a couple months before the war, or before D-Day had, we had two locations for cemeteries already picked out. But there's so many casualties, and I think there's like 3,000 deaths on Omaha Beach, um, or 3,000 Americans on, on D-Day. Um, they need another cemetery. And they make a provisional one. This is probably about five or 600 yards to the left of where you came in at. And they'll, they'll bury a lot of the Americans there. Um, 
Roy, you come in in a couple days later. First grave you get to, you find your brother's dog tags on it. So Ray doesn't make it. Uh, they will take this cemetery and move it up on the bluffs over about there, or they will send you home at your request. The only thing that's there now is uh, this marks the first site of the American Cemetery in World War II, since moved up on the hill. Ten years later, June 6, 1954, Bedford gets a monument to its lost sons. Taylor Feller's mom reveals the memorial polished granite. Got these Bedford boys that all show up there. Okay. So if you had picked one of those, that means you actually made it. June 2001, National D-Day Memorial is opened, 88 acres. 22 Bedford boys are killed in action. Out of 33, I think, that landed that day, six Bedford boys land and survive. Five Bedford boys come in uh, about four days later. They were the ones suffering from hypothermia when their boat sank, and they lost their equipment. Four Bedford boys, like Earl Newcomb, he's the company cook. You don't need a cook on the first day of the beach. You're not going to be having a beach barbecue. Okay? So they, don't, they never even landed. 103 Company A men paid the ultimate sacrifice. The source didn't designate whether that was on D-Day itself or all through the war. I think it was probably just D-Day. Um, Washington Post two years ago, 381 people from the regiment are killed in action that day. Here you are. Captain Fellers killed in action, leaves a widow. Lieutenant Ray Nance, multiple wounds, post-traumatic stress disorder, meets an army new nurse by the name of Alpha. They marry and live the rest of their life together. 1948, he considers this as one of the high points of his career. He actually arranges to reestablish the National Guard Company A in Bedford. So they get that going again. And uh, that company will actually go off to uh, Iraq, Iraq or Afghanistan in well, probably about 10 years ago. Jack Powers killed in action. His brother, Clyde, he's going to have a close encounter with a 88 shell, gets kind of shell shock, which is sort of like post-traumatic stress disorder, but, you know, you've been too close to the guns and it makes you nervous. Survivor's guilt. Why did I survive and my brother Jack get killed? And you see that fairly frequently if you start reading accounts of... Uh, People like this and other encounters during wars. Raymond Hoback, wounded in action, later drowned by the advancing tide. His body washes out, they think, they think to the sea, never recovered. Uh, but his Bible is recovered on the beach. Somebody finds it and sends it to the Hoback family. Bedford Hoback, killed in action. They lose, lose both of their sons. Leaves a fiance, parents never the same. Guys, we think the soldiers are. They're the ones that are killed, the ones that are maimed, the ones that are wounded, but the whole family is affected by this, too. It's not just those soldiers. Ray Stevens killed in action. Roy Stevens gets almost like a death complex, you know. He, give me all these dangerous missions, I'm going to go back, I'm going to kill one German for every one of our guys that got killed. Um, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, become a heavy drinker until he meets this nice 20-year-old Helen Cundiff. He always regretted not shaking Ray's hand on the ship when he had the opportunity. John Wilkes, probably killed while firing at the Germans, leaves his widow Betty. Frank Draper, killed in action, leaves a fiance, Charles Pfizer. He arrives. He was on that LCA 9-11 that sunk. He was killed on July 17th by a strafing German plane. Earl Parker disappeared. Sorry, Bob. Okay. Leaves his widow, Viola, and his daughter, Danny. Brother is killed in action. He's got another brother that wasn't in Company A. I think he was in Company C, killed in September. John Shank. Killed in action, probably by machine gun fire within minutes of landing. Leaves his widow, Ivy Lynn. His father would never, ever talk to the few of you that return. And he was 
angry at the army the rest of his life. He's a prisoner of this too, or a casualty. Dickie Overstreet, he got smart, get rid of his flamethrower, gets wounded in action. He's got PTSD with dreams of tanks rolling over GIs. Alan Huddleston, I don't know if anybody chose him. Remember, he, he's out of action. He hurt his ankle. <laughs> yep, had his ankle uh, broken. He heals up. He gets back on the front line. And first day out, he's shot through, I think, the right shoulder. Okay? So he has less than 24 hours in his combat career. All right? Missed D-Day, up there on the front line, wounded in action, never got back okay? because of a wound. Grant Yop, the guy that left his sick bed and went AWOL to be with his buddies, he's killed. And there's casualties on that day. Uh, this is the Parkers, Earl Parker here, our father. This is his brother that's killed in September. And there are other brothers, actually, I think uh, Air Force and shot down and becomes a POW for a good chunk of the war. So pretty tough on that family. Earl, anybody else who was Earl? Here's your daughter, Danny. You got to finally get a chance to meet her. She's there in 1954 when they have this celebration or this monument created. That's probably Taylor Feller's mother. And uh, that's the uh, names that are on it. I don't think Ivy Lynn has got the official word, although I, she's already received the missing in action telegram. But she's got some letters to John Shank that are returned, and they're stamped deceased. Um, and if she hadn't gotten the official word, that's kind of a, a rough way to learn that. Uh, if you're killed or wounded, you get the Purple Heart. That's John Shank's Purple Heart, his Bible. Um, those have all been donated to the National D-Day Foundation at Bedford. Frank Draper's mother, I, she writes this memorial letter on September of 1944. I can't even see your grave except in a dream. Now my mind wanders thousands of miles across the mighty deep to a lonely little mound in a foreign land where the body of my dear soldier boy might be laying away. This tired, homesick soldier boy who attended church in Bedford all his life, he was not buried in a nice casket. His dear body was laid to rest in a blood-soaked uniform. Maybe it was draped in an American flag. There will not be any more cruel wars where you have gone, dear Frank. The old rugged cross has a two-folded meaning for me. My own dear boy shed his precious blood like Jesus on the cross at Calvary. For our religious freedom, they say, a dear price to pay. Frank Draper's mom. Again, Roy Stevens got this death wish. Volunteers to lead a patrol. Then he regrets his decision. This is uh, seven days after D-Day. The moment I looked at the bottom of my foxhole and I saw the face of Jesus Christ, he said, go ahead, you'll come back. And he did. He survives that patrol. Uh, I came back just like he said I would. Right then and there I prayed and made a deal with God. If you'll let me get home, I'll be your servant. Again, if you start to read accounts of war veterans that, hey, God, let's make a deal here. Um, relatively common. Hits an anti-personnel mine, which shreds him. Uh, not enough to kill him, but apparently he's in such bad shape. He's in the ward where, let's put people, we're pretty sure they're going to die. I guess when they triage them. Grabs the smock of a passing nurse. I'm not here to die. I just need a little help, Roy begged. Nurse replied, if you let go of me, I'll see what I can do. He gets surgery and is flown back to England and will survive. Let's see, this is uh, Helen, who saved him from his alcoholism, and uh, Roy a little bit late, later in life. He writes a poem. I'll never forget that morning. It was the 6th of June. I said farewell to brother. Didn't think it would be so soon. I had prayed for our future, that wonderful place called home, but a sinner's prayer wasn't answered. Now I'll have to go there alone. Oh, brother, I think of you all through the sleepless night. Dear Lord, he took you from me, and I can't believe it was right. The world is so unfriendly. To kill is now a sin. 
to walk that long, narrow road. It can't be done without him. Dear mother, I know your worries. This is an awful fight to lose my only twin brother and suffer the rest of my life. Now, fellows, take my warning. Believe it from start to end. If you ever have a twin brother, don't go to battle with him. Guys, pretty depressing what happens to the Bedford boys. We do take Omaha. We free Western Europe from the Nazis, kick them out, give them a chance at freedom. The Colville Samir Cemetery, that's it, part of it. 9,386 Americans are buried there. Um, they are not all killed on D-Day. If you're killed on D-Day or June 7th or June 8th or June 9th, up till about, I think, July 20th, when we finally kind of break out of this Normandy Peninsula and get wheeling into the rest of France, then they build another cemetery further closer to the front. But if you're buried in that six-week period of time, I'm sorry, killed, you're generally buried there, or you're sent home at the request of your family. Okay. 405,000 Americans killed in World War II or die in World War II. Not all of them from combat action. There are still 70,000 Americans missing from World War II, even now. Most of them probably in ships that went down. They don't know if they lived or died or whatever. Missing and presumed dead. Cemetery there. Uh, guys, this is a uh, place to go in and kind of... Uh, Say prayers, meditate, stuff like that. You can see the D-Day Memorial there, from, which is similar to that cartoon that I showed you. Um, inside of that building right there, uh, you've got, oh, back up here, Ten Commandments. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Through the gate of death may they pass to their joyful resurrection. Just a little bit of religion and Christianity inside that building. Uh, coming from the American government. Bedford Hoback's grave is over there. Lieutenant Ray Nance with his wife, Alpha. And uh, John Shank's grave, he never got sent home. Uh, there's a uh, French, I guess, blog called Memoir, a database. And I guess database doesn't uh, translate. Uh, database, whatever country you're in. Let's see if I remember my French. We got 24th December 1942. Earth Angel, my dear Lynn. Uh, here, here it is Christmas Eve, and I'm 4,000 miles away from you. My heart, but my heart is with you always. And uh, they've been posting some of his letters on their memoir, a database site. Generally, the French, especially in Normandy, um, or maybe only in Normandy, are very good towards Americans because they know what we've done for them. And by the way, they helped us out quite a bit in the American Revolution, too. So, Outside of the American Cemetery at Omaha Beach, you can manufacture weapons and you can purchase ammunition, but you can't buy valor and you can't pull heroes off an assembly line. The uh, 29th Division Memorial on top of that German uh, emplacement right there on, on your A Company beach. Coming home, requested to come home, John Wilkes, Ray Stevens, John Clifton, Taylor, Captain Taylor Fellers. They were all brought home at the request of their families. Fellers' premonition, we're all going to be killed. Not entirely accurate, but pretty close. Uh, some of the other tombstones, John Allen, a Bedford boy killed. Sleep on, dear son, and take your rest. Our hearts are broken, but God knows best. Fa mother, father, and sisters. John Reynolds, lost on earth, but found in heaven. And uh, Frank Draper, our baseball player. Our precious son from us is gone. His voice we loved is still. His place is vacant in our home, which never can be filled. We loved you, Junie, dearly loved you, but God loved you best. He took you home to heaven, where all is peace and rest. Our loss is heaven gains, is heaven's gain, father, mother, brother, sister. Bedford, a pretty religious Christian community. Uh, 
If you walk the streets of uh, Bedford in modern day times, there's a number of shops that unfortunately have gone out of business. Um, but they usually put pictures of you all in the windows and sometimes have military equipment there. Uh, let's see, that's Yop, that's a Hoback, that's a Hoback. Uh, I think that's uh, Powers, uh, John Wilkes. So they're still remembering you. Another good Memorial Day cartoon. I had no idea that freedom was so expensive. Bob Slaughter is from D Company. I think he's from Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, and the way National Guard units, you know, they had Company A at Bedford and Company D, I think, at Lynchburg, and Company B was Charlottesville, and again, there was a, a company from Frederick, Maryland. Um, he knows a lot of guys from uh, A Company, and he pushes to have the National D-Day Memorial located in Bedford, Virginia, which he pushes it through with the help of the government, and it's dedicated. 2001, President Bush shows up, and uh, which I, there's two mountains back there that you can see from the town. I think they call them the Twin Otter Peaks. Very pretty. National D-Day Memorial there, and you've got uh, some of those obstacles. You've got a soldier wading in, a couple soldiers here, and a soldier, unfortunately, a casualty already. Closer version there. And there's also a sculpture there of a place called Point the Hawk. If you don't know what Point the Hawk is, rent the movie or stream it or whatever you do nowadays. Get the movie The Longest Day from 1963. Um, Point the Hawk is an actual cliff. And they send rangers there to get up it because there's big guns that are supposed to be on it. Um, pretty impressive feat that they have to go through, but again, they climbed up, again, almost straight. Um, nice thing about the film, The Longest Day, they let, the French let them film it right on location. So it's right where uh, those guys actually scaled that cliff in that movie, The Longest Day. And you don't, they don't do that in modern day movies, for historical reasons. View from the top, and uh, I was hoping my friend here, Guy Witten, was going to be able to come here tonight, but he was kind of exhausted. He was up at the World War II weekend last weekend for about three and a half days at Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, and he was a paratrooper from the 502nd. He didn't land on the beach, but he plane and dropped behind it. Uh, and I had the honor of taking him down because he had never been to the D-Day Memorial. I got opportunity to take him down there and show it to him, or and show me too. So. Memorial Day, a celebration of U.S. imperialism. Dan Bongino, he says, if people ask you this, where's our empire? Okay. And we did, we did have some imperialistic times in our country's history, where we took over things like the Philippines and stuff like that. But we go into France, we go into Germany, we go into Belgium, the Netherlands. We help set those countries up. We give them $13 billion in Western Europe, which is probably equivalent to five or hundred billion or something nowadays, um, to help them rebuild. We even give it to the Germans, okay? Germany split into West Germany, the British, French, and Americans. You know, kind of take control of that. East Germany is taken over by the, the Soviets. Um, we give the money to the Germans to help them rebuild. We give money to the Japanese to help them rebuild. By the late 1960s, two of the top five economic powers in the world, Germany and Japan, which we help rebuild. Now, I think both of those cultures it's not like we did it all on our own. Both of those cultures are very strong, dynamic uh, people that I, I think have a lot of confidence and strength and, and stuff in themselves. So they're part of the driving force too. But we gave it back to them. We could have taken that. We had it. Guys, South Korea. We saved South Korea. 
to go to Vietnam and you know, try to save them from communism. Um, we actually give up the Philippines. So where's our empire? I think Bongino's got kind of a good thing there. Where is our empire? You know, we've gone into Iraq. We were there for a while, but we gave that back. We're trying to get out of Afghanistan. Getting in there, a little tough situation. Historically, it's not been a good place to go and get and survive there uh, and control. Ask the British, ask the Russians. Okay. HBO movie called Taking Chance with, uh, oh gosh, uh, Bacon. Uh, Footloose guy? Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Okay, I couldn't remember his foot name, okay? Uh, he portrays a real Marine in here. This is a story. Um, there's a private or a corporal that's killed in Iraq, and he gets the escort duty to bring him home. Again, if you want to know what, more about what Memorial Day is about, I strongly recommend that. I showed it to my kids in school, and they said, I was, I've taken some of them on a field trip, and some of them stayed there. Why'd you show us that movie? It made me cry. <laughs> well, that sounds like it was a good thing then, okay? Uh, and again, I think you guys all know what Memorial Day is about, but uh, lots of sources there. Again, uh, Kershaw's book, probably the number one best book. There's a lot of other stuff out there. Um, I'm taking summer off. I think a lot of you guys are taking summers off too. I can't see running the class in July and August. So we'll, get, we'll pick up if we still want to continue this American Revolution and God's influence, pick it up in September and continue again next year. Questions? Did you survive? I did not. Who were, who were you? I didn't even check my hand. <laughs> Roy. Roy, 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 Roy. <laughs> so sorry about it. <laughs> yeah, he had to deal with that all his life if it, make, if it makes you feel better. How many times, uh, Fritz, have you done this presentation at school? Um... It's a little bit different because I have six different days, and I don't do it the whole, I didn't do it like the whole hour and a half every day, but I would, I would show a section of the presentation of the PowerPoint, and then I had cards with their names on it that told them kind of what happened to them individually, um, but at least 30. It's percentage-wise, it's the highest, what they call per capita casualty rate of any, un any city on D-Day. Now, were there more New Yorkers that got killed on D-Day? I'm sure there were, but New York population at that time was probably 5 million, and the population of Bedford, I think, was like 3,000. So to lose 22 out of those 3,000 and... Small town, it, you almost know everybody or you know the family. So, I'm sorry? You know of them, yeah. And uh, what's his name? The Flake, Jim, the car comedy guy. Jim Carrey. Uh, I'm not a super fan of all of his movies, but he does a movie uh, called The Majestic. If you've never seen it, it's, it's actually very good fun, uh, very entertaining. It's about World War II. It's also about the Cold War and uh, witch hunts and stuff like that. But the town that he goes to in California gave up, you know, 30-some-odd sons of it. It's small town, too. Uh, and I, they stole it from here, which is fine, okay? But a super high casualty rate for that small California town. Uh, and Carrie did a pretty good job with it. So, other questions? Other comments? High price for freedom. Yeah, that one cartoon. Yeah, I didn't realize 
little kid said, what, the cost of freedom was so high? Um, I, again, I, I'm sure there's nobody in here who doesn't know what Memorial Day is about, but uh, spread it around. Okay, well, thank you all. If you want to try on the equipment, see how far you can run with that, okay? Uh, look at some of the books here. Get stuck by the barbed wire. It's pretty rusty. I hope you had your tetanus shot. <laughs> <laughs>